welcome everybody to today's uh, VMAX session. So we have uh, two papers today, um, short 10 minute presentation by Hannah Rubenton on the geography of business dynamism. And then uh, after that, we have uh, Janice Eberle on potential capital. Let me just remind everybody, if you can ask uh, questions in, uh, in the Q&A and, um, and then they will be answered by co-authors uh, there. Uh, and then at the end of the talk, we have um, 10 minutes for, for live uh, questions. Uh, where you just need to raise your hand. And uh, after the, the full hour, we'll have um, another post-session room and we'll post the link in the, in the chat. Um, okay, so with that, uh, let's start off uh, with Hannah. Hannah, the floor is yours. So first off, thank you so much to the organizers for including my project in this great series. I'm really excited to share with you this paper, The Geography of Business Dynamism and Skill Bias Technical Change. And so the motivation for this project is that we all know since 1980, there's been a substantial increase in the skill premium, along with a substantial increase in the supply of skilled labor. However, both of these trends were uneven across space. In particular, both the increase in the skill premium and the increase in the supply of skilled labor were more prevalent in big cities relative to small cities. And these growing differences between big and small cities has become known as the great divergence. And literature, literature has documented implications of this great divergence for growing political tensions, increasing disparities in health outcomes and economic mobility. And so the question that I wanna ask in this paper is what is the underlying cause of the great divergence? And in order to answer this question, I'm going to make two contributions. So the first contribution is I'm going to document two new facts on the Great Divergence. So the first fact that I show is that while big cities have increasingly offered a higher skill premium and be become more skill abundant, they've also become more dynamic. And by dynamic, I'm referring to rates of business dynamism, such as the firm startup rate, exit rate, job creation, and job destruction. And I show that today, big cities are much more dynamic in, uh, than small cities, whereas in 1980, there was really no relationship between dynamism and city size. The second fact that I show is that firms in big cities are, more, are spending more intensively on information and communications technologies than firms in small cities. So these are goods like computers and software that we often think of as being complementary with high-skilled labor. And then in the second contribution, I'm going to provide a theory that can jointly explain all of these facts about the great divergence. And so the crux of the, the theory is that when a new skill bias technology gets introduced, it's endogenously going to be adopted in big cities compared to small cities. And since it's a uh, skill bias technology and it's adopted more in the big cities, the big cities are going to experience more skill bias technical change than the small cities, and this can explain the great divergence. So um, let me just jump right into showing you these two main facts that I document. So first is the changing relationship between dynamism and city size. And so by dynamism, I'm referring to all, all different measures of firm dynamics, such as the startup rate, exit rate, job creation, destruction. But here I'm just showing you the establishment startup rate versus city size. And in black is the relationship in 1980, and in green is 2018. And as you can see, there's been this well-documented aggregate decline in dynamism. But this decline was really much more pronounced in, in small cities relative to big cities. And I don't have time to go through it today, but in the paper, I show that this is robust to controlling for uh, city level differences in industry composition. So this isn't just true if you look at the establishment startup rate. This is also true if you look at the establishment exit rate. So now I'm showing you the establishment exit rate versus city size, and you can see the same pattern holds. So this is showing you that big cities are really exhibiting more churn today than small cities. They have both higher rates of entry and exit. So you might be thinking that this is just because the big cities are growing faster. If they have more population growth, they'll have more entry. They don't actually have more population growth, but in the paper, I do control for population growth. I control for prime age share. And then I also look at these exit rates by age of establishment. And in particular, this is most pronounced for young establishments or establishments attached to young firms. So here I'm showing you the establishment exit rate conditional on firm age versus city size. And you can see that this pattern is holding within age group. So this can't be explained just by age composition of the establishments. So the second fact that I document in this paper is that firms in big cities are investing more in ICT or information and communications technologies. 
So what I'm showing you here is regression output from a regression of a firm level regression of ICT spending on city size. And in this first column, I'm showing you the relationship between ICT investment per employee and city size. And you can see that firms in big cities are spending more per employee uh, than firms in small cities. And this, this holds even if you control for industry composition and characteristics of the firm, such as age and size. In the second column, I look at ICT uh, share of total investment, and you can see this is also increasing in city size. So this is an important distinction because this means that ICT is behaving differently than other types of investment. It's increasing faster with city size than investment such as structures and equipment. Okay. Oops. So the second part of the, the paper is to provide a unified theory that can jointly explain all of these facts about the great divergence. And the crux of the theory is that a new technology is going to be introduced and it's endogenously going to be uh, adopted more in big cities than small cities. So to start with, I build a spatial equilibrium model. There's high and low skilled labor that's freely mobile across cities. And this allows me to speak to these facts about relative wages and relative supply of skilled workers across space. And then within each city, I embed this Hopenhain model of firm dynamics, which allows me to speak to these facts about business dynamism. And then I calibrate the model to the data in 1980 and show that it can match the relevant features of the 1980 study state. And importantly, I want to emphasize that this means that cities are going to differ ex ante, um, uh, uh, are already going to differ ex ante before I introduce this new technology. So for example, in 1980, big cities are going to have more abundant amenities for high-skilled workers, and they're going to have a productivity advantage for using high-skilled workers even before this new technology is introduced. And these characteristics are what's needed to justify the, the existing data in 1980 even before the great divergence. So then the next thing I do is I use this model to analyze a skill bias technical change shock. So specifically what I have in mind is a new technology is introduced it's more skill intensive. It has an absolute productivity advantage, but in order to use it, firms pay an additional fixed cost. And so even though the shock is available, the shock is uniform across space, this new technology is available everywhere, it's endogenously going to be adopted more in big cities and small cities. And so it can predict the changes across cities in wages, skill intensity, and firm dynamics. So these great key components of the great divergence that I document. And the driving force in the model is that the extent of adoption is heterogeneous across cities, and it's going to be influenced by four main channels. So first is a market size channel. So firms that are in big cities are going to be more willing to incur this additional fixed cost of using the new technology, so they'll be more likely to adopt. Second is the initial technology. So firms in big cities are um, that or firms in cities that are ex ante already good at using high skilled labor are going to be more likely to adopt. Third is amenities. If a city has abundant amenities for high skilled workers, then all else equal, um, the skill premium will be lower and the return to adopting will be higher. And then fourth is a selection channel. And by selection, I mean the exit threshold below which firms will exit the market. So as uh, some cities adopt more than others, um, they're gonna be more congested and selection is gonna increase. So the small unproductive firms are gonna be more likely to exit the market. And since these small unproductive firms are not using the new technology, they use the old technology, this amplifies the difference in adoption rates across cities. And this is the same channel drive the changing patterns of dynamism across cities. So as selection becomes tougher in big cities relative to small cities, dynamism rates in big cities are going to increase relative to the small cities. And so I wanna emphasize that all four of these channels Mark, or with the exception of market size, the initial technology, amenities, and selection, they're not inherently about city size, but it just so happens that when I calibrate the model to the data in 1980, big cities are gonna have abundant amenities for high-skilled workers, and they're also gonna have a comparative advantage in using high-skilled workers. So all four of these channels are gonna work in the direction of having adoption be higher in big cities relative to small cities. So then finally, I'm gonna use this model to undertake uh, two counterfactual analyses. And these are motivated by um, the question of what could policymakers do if they wanted to increase adoption in small cities. 
And so I analyzed two counterfactuals. So first is subsidizing the fixed cost of adoption in small cities. And the second is subsidizing high skilled labor in small cities. So what's um, what I want to emphasize is that subsidizing the fixed cost is very ineffective in increasing adoption. So the reason that this is ineffective is because the marginal cost savings from adopting the new technology in small cities is simply not large enough that the fixed cost isn't making such a big difference. So um, and the reason for this is because there have an, a comparative comparative advantage in using the, the old technology. And then when the new technology gets introduced, there's more sorting of high and low skilled workers across space. The low skilled workers become more abundant in the small cities and it um, amplifies these differences. So they have even more of an, a reason to stick with the old technology. Subsidizing the high skilled labor on the other hand in the small cities directly targets their marginal cost savings so it increases the marginal cost differences between the old technology and the new technology, and this will increase adoption quite a bit in the small cities. But it's important to note that this is at the expense of the big cities, so if you increase adoption or if you subsidize high skilled labor in the small cities, then. Uh, high skilled labor is going to become more scarce and more expensive in the big cities, decreasing adoption there. So this is sort of a zero sum, sum game. So to quickly conclude, I showed you two new facts about the great divergence. First is this increasing relationship between dynamism and city size. Second is that firms are um, investing more intensively in ICT related goods um, and big cities relative to small cities. And then I provide a unified theory to jointly explain several facts about the great divergence. So I build a spatial equilibrium model with firm dynamics, and I use it to analyze the uneven diffusion of a new skill bias technology. And I show that the skill bias technology shock, even though it's uniform across space, can match these several key features of the great divergence. So thank you all very much for listening and for having me in this uh, series. I'd love to hear any comments or questions. You can always email me or put them in the, the chat. So thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Hannah, and uh, also thanks for being so precise on the time. Um, so uh, great. Um, if you could unshare, and then uh, we'll leave the floor instead to Janice. Uh, see if and Janice, you need to unmute yourself. Great. Thanks very much. Okay. Um, you can see the slides. Yeah, it, everything works. So, uh, so uh, I'll leave the floor to you. Uh, you will have 40 minutes. Great. Thanks very much, uh, Morton. And, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me and, and us to present this work. Um, the, the paper and this project is joint work with Jonathan Haskell from Imperial College in the Bank of England and Paul Mizen um, from the University of Nottingham. Um, it is preliminary work, so we really appreciate the, the chance to get your feedback um, today. Um, as you can see, the title is expanded relative to what we initially circulated um, to be a little less cryptic and a little more descriptive. Um, it's actually almost exactly the question that motivated the conversation between Jonathan and, and Paul and, and me early last fall. Um, to ask how much worse the output decline would have been, um, as catastrophic as it was, but how much worse it might have been during COVID-19 if it had happened 15 or 20 years ago, um, when we all had only dial-up connections and no conferencing software and, and many of the amenities that, that we're using currently and, and in our professional lives. So what we try to do in, in this project um, is to structure that question more um, carefully and also to try to quantify an, an answer to it. So let me start with the, an example um, from using UK data and which we'll use UK data as the core during much of the presentation, but we'll also present data from other countries. Um, and I should say that we'll, we'll also use log points throughout, which is useful in uh, growth accounting. Um, so in the UK data going back to 2019, um, over the course of COVID, um, total hours worked fell by 13%, again in log points. Um, but hours worked on premises 
fell by 36%, where on-premises means work hours at work, so literally at the workplace. And which clearly reflects, reflects the rise in, in working from home uh, also. But with an output of elasticity of two thirds, if, uh, if there was a 36% decline in hours on premises, you would have expected that alone to reduce output by 24%. Um, if we add to that changes in capital utilization, um, if workers, being off premises means that the capital stock on premises is underutilized um, with an output elasticity of one third, you would get an additional reduction in output of 3% if we just use the reduction in, in labor on premises and translate that into capital utilization or an even larger number of 8% if we map capital utilization to electricity usage in the, in the commercial sector. Um, so putting those together, you would expect based on the utilization of factors on premises, that output would have fallen at least by 24%, just based on the, the labor reduction, the hours reduction, and maybe as much as 32%. Um, if we include the capital effects. But in fact, the actual change in output in log points was 11%. Uh, and, and just to be clear, these are quarterly changes in log points, so this may not correspond exactly to numbers you're used to hearing, which are seasonally adjusted annual rates uh, from, the, from the national accounts. Um, but our main point being that while this reduction in, in output was clearly very large, if you just look at factor utilization in the, in the commercial sector, you might have expected an even larger reduction uh, in output. And the, the way we describe the, the difference or what might explain the difference between um, those two numbers is this term potential capital, by which mean, we mean capital that was not previously utilized but was made available by digital technologies. So much of the, the literature and, and discussion has focused on the enormous increase and, and advent in, in some areas of work from home. So in the UK, uh, there is survey data on this, which is why we, we use the UK data extensively. Um, they reported that work from home rose from 14% in the, at the end of 2019, and it had been pretty steady at about that level previously, um, to 35% by the second quarter in the, the depths of the uh, COVID-19 shock. So some estimates are even higher in the US and other countries. So in addition to taking into account the fact that we have labor working at home, we wanna ask the question of how is this possible? what capital did they use in order to be able to effectively work from home? Just having a, a, a lay, you know, one of us in front of our computer at home is not nearly as productive as having that employee with uh, a computer that's connected to the internet, that's connected to all of your other uh, co-authors and other labor using capital elsewhere. Um, so this potential capital um, we think of as providing not just um, at static capital services, not just an office, but also connectivity to the rest of the, the labor force. So today we want to ask two specific questions um, that we've tackled so far in, the, in this project. The first is a growth accounting question. That is, how much did potential capital and labor that's working from home contribute to output? So that's the specific question that, that motivated us. Um, and, and then a more forward looking question, um, which has uh, a number of people have been asking whether, is whether this work, working from home is likely to persist. Um, and in the data that we have, we'll be able to estimate the substitutability that we saw over COVID, COVID from working at work to working from home. And we wanna think, use that to think about the question about substituting back from home to working at work and, and what may happen in the future. Let me start with a growth accounting question. 
Um, so the standard production function, which we'll use here, um, has output as a function of productivity, capital, and labor, where labor is the sum of individual workers and, and their hours. Um, so what was unique about the COVID shock relative to a standard productivity shock is that it required individual workers to isolate from each other, and in some cases also to isolate from customers, which turns out to be important um, as we go forward uh, in the talk. So labor was distributed back out of the factory, back out of stores, back out of offices. Um, and in doing so also was not only remote from other labor, but was also remote from the traditional capital stock. Um, so if we think of you know, people working together with computers, when we went back to work at home, we were also remote from the capital stock that we would have used in an office setting. So the ability for individual workers to actually function depended on not, not only the availability of capital in the home setting or in the remote setting, um, but in the case of COVID, immediate availability of that because the pivot was, was so fast. Um, and the creation of this new workspace where workers, where labor is not only you know, in interacting with their individual workspace, but also able to sort of recreate what they had at the office to interact with other um, employees. So the thought experiments we wanna think about are an environment where traditional capital, all of our copy machines and, and large computers uh, and maybe the servers remain on premises while the labor disperses to remote locations. And one thought experiment is what if no capital was available to the dispersed labor? So capital at home is actually zero. Um, and the second thought experiment is what if there is capital actually available to workers who are working from home, and on top of that actually reconnects them um, to recreate this virtual workspace. And, and that's what we wanna think of as this potential capital. Um, so just to give you a sense of the broad sense of the data before we dive in, um, this is the cross industry data um, from, there, there's two sources, we'll use the, the DMP and the, the Office of National Statistics data. Um, this is the DMP, which shows, um, you know, it's, it's, it's still sort of breathtaking, um, even though we, we know how bad the shock was, but this is in May 2020, the impact of COVID on, on sales by industry. And in these highly consumer facing services, there were declines in sales of 50 to 80%, even in production um, and these less consumer facing services, there's declines of 30 to 50% and, and essential services had the smallest declines, but still you know, large even in, in business cycle um, standards. Uh, that's highly correlated with the impact in the labor market. And, and this is where the British data is especially useful for us because they have a survey that clarifies which workers were on furlough, that's what's in the blue, so the um, participating in the furlough program that the British government put in place. And then the yellow is the working from home and the gray in the middle is working on premises. So only a small percentage, these orange um, bars were unable to work at all. So most workers who were not actively working for their firms were actually um, on furlough. And we can talk about the details of that program um, if you're interested, but in the um, interest of time, I'm gonna focus on the work from home component here and the work from work, the gray component here. So on average, about 35% um, at this point of workers were working from home. So a very large pivot um, to the work from home format. And then, um, you know, maybe a surprising number of working from work, but the work from home is concentrated in particular kinds of services. So high productivity services like information and communications technology, 
financial services and professional and, and scientific services. Um, so we'll make extensive use of, of these data. Um, so the approach we take is uh, familiar uh, to us from growth accounting. Um, I'll start with the UK data and then I'll show you some results for other countries. We have total hours worked um, and the, the work from home data allows us to separate hours at work that is on premises from hours at home, uh, which is crucial for our exercise. Now in capital, I mentioned this in the motivation is, is an important part of the um, uh, analysis. We don't have direct data on capital utilization at this frequency because we're doing it um, over the course of 2020. Um, so on the work side, we have um, capital at work pre-COVID, um, and we also have a, a measure of utilization using uh, commercial energy use. And um, it, it's really fascinating. A number of papers have looked at this of how commercial energy use declined uh, during COVID, you know, right away during the the slowdown and residential commercial uh, energy use stayed high. Um, and we're measuring home utilization using a proxy, basically paralleling the labor allocation. So we have capital at home, which is uh, in the British data called dwellings capital in the US data, it's residential capital. Um, and then we scale that by labor force participation. So we're only using dwellings of workers and then using a, a proxy to parallel the labor application uh, allocations. So workers, only the share of workers working at home. So we, we narrow residential um, or dwellings capital down to worker capital at home and then the share of workers who are working from home to get an estimate of uh, capital used at home. Um, and we won't do this across industries at the moment, uh, but we have aspirations uh, to do that. So the, the, in the, the structure that we use is completely standard growth accounting. We'll use one third and, and two thirds capital and labor shares. Our innovation are, is to split out, for example, the labor contribution into the share of labor at work and the growth of labor at work and the share of labor at home, the growth of labor at home, and then the same thing for the capital share. So when we look at the, contribu the direct contribution of potential capital, for example, we'll look at the, the product of the share of capital at home times the growth in capital at home. And that's the direct contribution of capital at home, but of course, there's also um, the labor uh, at home. And so we'll look at the, the home contribution as the, the sum of labor at home and, and capital at home. Um, all right. So to give you a, a sense of the, the magnitudes, starting with the, the UK data um, on the left, and this is just looking at levels. Um, so before we get to the, the growth rates that are in the growth accounting exercise, here you see you know, a, slow, a small decline in output in Q1 um, when the virus had, had barely begun to, to circulate in the UK. And then a very, you know, this is where you see the more catastrophic decline in output and a bit of a recovery in Q3 um, and roughly steady in Q4. The total hours, here's the, the decline. So you can see that the furloughs are taken out here. So you have only, this is the sum of workers on premises and workers at home. And then here's the share on premises and here's the 35% uh, at home in the second quarter that, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and the last two columns show capital broken out to capital at work and you see it decline substantially in Q2, reflecting lower utilization. Um, and then the capital at home looks pretty similar to labor at home in the sense that it starts out um, with modest growth in Q1, big jump in Q2, and then uh, slight decline, but fairly steady uh, thereafter. Okay. 
Um, the growth accounting calculations um, then here are done in, in growth rates. And the first five columns are just the growth rate counterparts to the, the data that I showed you in the previous table. Um, but the last four columns are the, the growth accounting calculations. So let me first draw your attention to the contributions of home capital and, and home labor in yellow. And, and I'll focus on the second quarter because that's obviously when the virus had its most catastrophic uh, impact. So the contribution of capital at home to quarterly GDP uh, is 3% in the second quarter, which means that the contribution of capital at home by itself increased GDP by 3%, uh, which we think of as a pretty substantial effect. Um, and then the labor contribution was 5%. So together, the home sector, uh, the home geography, uh, contributed 8% uh, to GDP. Now, I think that in itself is, is, is interesting, but the, the impact on TFP um, is also worth, worth recognizing. Um, so this, this blue column shows the TFP at work. That is, if you ignore the contribution of home capital and just calculated the solo residual, basically, if you calculated TFP, based on output, total output and just fa work factors, you would conclude that there was a TFP boom in the second quarter because the factors declined so much more than output did, right? Um, so it looks like TFP goes um, up. And, and there, you know, there is some discussion now about what's happening with business productivity that it seems to be fairly high. And, and some of that is that we're surely not attributing correctly the, the factors that are used from home in business production. Once you take those out, our estimate would take out 8% of GDP, leaving t still a very positive TFP uh, innovation of uh, 6%. So comparing that to other countries, um, we can, we have data, we're looking at mostly the OECD countries because of data availability. We can get total hours worked. We have the same uh, or similar data to estimate the capital inputs. But the working from home data is more spotty um, across these countries. So we use a different uh, methodology, which is the Google mobility data um, has an estimate of mobility to work. Um, and that's available across all of the countries that, that I'll show you momentarily. And it's also available for the UK. So we could use the UK data to calibrate um, the Google mobility data to work from home, and then use that calibration um, to map the Google mobility data um, for other countries into an, an estimate of work from home uh, for those other countries. And the results are shown here in uh, bar charts, it's a little easier to see since there's so many countries. So the UK data I just showed you in the table are represented here on the right. So the second quarter, if you just looked at um, the contribution of work factors, you would have predicted almost a 35% decline in, in output. That's what's shown here. Um, that's compensated somewhat by the 8% contribution of the home sector. Um, which is what was in the table, um, and then a 6% uh, increase in or implied increase in, in TFP. Um, the third quarter, um, and you see this systematically, there's this flip as the, um, the, the path of the virus changes and there's a return to work. So work output contributes more, um, office output declines. These are all in growth rates. So actually, uh, home output is roughly flat. And then there's a flip to um, working from work. And then everything is fairly stable in the fourth quarter. So the changes are less pronounced. And the, so there's a shrinkage in the fourth quarter. In the US, you see the same pattern, um, but different magnitudes. So the uh, decline in working from work is less pronounced. So there were fewer um, shutdowns and, and fewer people 
um, leaving their workplaces in the US, but still it would imply by itself a 17% decline in output, compensated partially by a 9% increase in output from home. Um, and then the, the change in productivity is small and negative. If you didn't account for output from home, you would have uh, estimated an 8% increase in, in TFP uh, in the second quarter in the US. Um, and then there's this flip in the third quarter as there is a return to work, small increase in TFP as, as people go back to work and then shrinkage uh, in the fourth quarter. For other, for continental uh, Europe, Again, the pattern is the same. Let me just look at um, Italy. Things started very early there. Sharp decline in output from work, flips in the third quarter, somewhat of a compensation in output from home. So it's a very similar pattern um, that you see in all of these countries. I think what's interesting here is um, not only the magnitudes are a little different, but the timing starts earlier. Um, there's a bigger impact in the first quarter um, reflecting a larger impact um, of the virus as it started in um, started earlier in continental Europe. And that fact is even more pronounced in Japan, um, where there's a, a large decline in output from work in the first quarter, um, and it persists longer. Um, so in um, Japan and, and Asia more generally, um, the impact was larger earlier on, um, and then you get the flip in the uh, third quarter as, as we see throughout the, the data. Um, so what is this? I mean, these effects seem, seem very large, and I want to think about what this potential capital actually is. Um, it's actually not new at, at all. Um, so this is essentially the business model of Uber and Airbnb, who are using personal capital um, that's underutilized and, and putting it to business use. Um, but what's happened during COVID and, and what we're capturing in growth accounting is that this happened at a much larger scale uh, in COVID. So it happened throughout the economy, not just in particular businesses where domestic and, and residential capital was put to use for, for business purposes. Um, and the other thing that's notable um, about this is the necessity of the connectivity. That is the, the internet conferencing software like we're all using here was really essential to recreate the workspace. So it's not as simple as having a home office. It's having a home office that actually enables um, produ production, um, at least in some of these high productivity uh, especially high productivity service industries. Um, and that's reflected um, at, in these service industries prior investments um, in intangible capital. Um, so this is really the, the connection that had Jonathan and, and Paul and I to begin talking about this was the role of the um, investments in ICT and software that you see on the horizontal axis, uh, and this is by industry, is highly positively correlated with the share of workers that ended up working from home uh, during the pandemic. So this connectivity um, seems to have uh, played a crucial role, or at least is, is highly correlated with what we eventually saw as home capital and the ability to work from home. Um, the last thing I wanna briefly mention is um, what happened um, post COVID or what may happen post COVID and, and what we can learn from that um, from our data. Um, so we wanna ask um, whether work from home will persist after as COVID recedes. And we, th we wanna th think of that as depending on why work from home grew in the first place. Um, so it may be because relative prices changed. Um, essentially, it became very expensive to have labor on premises, to have labor at work um, because of the cost of providing health protections, of providing so social distancing, of providing personal protective equipment. And as COVID recedes, we hope, then those expenses will diminish 
And we could see at least a partial reversal in working from home as people go back to the office um, and it's less expensive uh, to be there. The second possible explanation is that work from home was actually not accommodated pre-COVID. Um, so there could have been the capacity to work from home, and we suspect there was because we pivoted to work from home so quickly. Um, the capacity seems to have been there already, uh, but it was not accommodated um, before this large shock. Um, so a large shock forced work from home at large scale um, and solved what may have been a collective action problem. Um, so people have, have said, well, I wanted to work from home before, but it's very hard to be the only person working from home. So even if you have Zoom, we haven't developed the, the capacity or the norms to have some workers working from home when most workers are, are at the office. Um, so this large shock may have solved that collective action problem, uh, in which case it may be more likely that work from home will persist. Um, the other explanation could be that work from home was not understood, um, that we had the capacity, but we just didn't know how to do it. Uh, and there has certainly been learning over the pandemic, um, especially, for example, how to implement uh, hybrid. So um, working partially at work and, and partially at home. So if there's been learning, then that likely will persist. So using our data, we want to ask um, if we can distinguish the price effects, would, which would suggest a, a reversal, at least a partial reversal um, from collective action and, and learning, which might suggest that work from home might be more persistent. Um, so in order to do that, we'll use a pretty standard um, production function with a, as a CES aggregator. So this is the um, same function used by Otter and Katz in their handbook chapter, but where they were looking at skilled labor and unskilled labor. So this sort of goes back to Hannah's presentation uh, as well. And But we want to think about these uh, instead of skilled and unskilled as uh, home and work. Um, so we have uh, a work production function where we have capital and labor, and we have a home production function with capital and labor at home, and then there's substitutability between these locations. Um, so there's interpretations of the B parameters and the beta parameters, but I, for time purposes, I, I won't, or time constraints, I won't go into those details um, at the moment, but this is the, the setup we use to motivate our uh, estimation. So in long changes, that production function gives us um, a, a way of thinking about the change in uh, labor at home relative to labor at work as a function of the relative prices of labor at home and labor at work, and then a set of technology parameters that depend on these um, Bs and, and betas from the production function. Um, so we can use, here we're going to go back to the British um, data, the, the DMP, because it has this detailed information on labor at home and labor at work, um, and has specific hours uh, at home and at work. And the, the data also include a very convenient um, survey for these purposes, which is a firm level survey um, by industry provided, answered quarterly, on the cost of having employees at work, um, including things like personal protective equipment and health measures such as social distancing. Um, so it's, it's very specific um, and we think uh, um, potentially a way of measuring these relative prices um, of having a worker um, on premises versus at home. Um, there's, these technology terms we also think are um, going to be important uh, in two ways. There's sort of the, the traditional technology measures, things like physical capital intensity, um, information and communications technology. So um, technology that's available um, in the, at the firm level and, and we'll measure it by industry. But during COVID, there's also the virus technology that is workers may be um, driven home 
by exposure to the virus. Uh, and so we want to include me those measures in our um, estimation. And there's one negative result that, that I want to mention, which uh, we thought was, um, while a negative result, kind of interesting, and, and it bears on the later results. Uh, and that has to do with worker to customer contacts. So you, you might think, we thought <laughs> that uh, customer contacts might predict work from home due to health risk. That is, if you have a lot of customer contacts and you look at the scale here, um, you know, there are 15 to 20 um, customer contacts per day in some industries. So there's a lot of potential for transmission and that might drive workers to work from home. Um, that actually turns out not to be the case. Um, and it's because of the characteristics of jobs that have a lot of customer contacts are jobs that are face-to-face -face services. So you, do, you, you don't want people to con continue doing those jobs because of the risk of virus tech, uh, transmission, but they can't do their jobs from home um, because it requires face-to-face -face contact with customers. So they tend to be things like accommodation and food service um, that are not work from home uh, industries. So this is a case where the technology is important. So things like the, the Bs and the betas um, are zero in this case. So essentially you get a corner solution on working from home because of the, the technology in the industry. Um, so instead, what those high customer contacts predict is high furloughs. Um, so it's not really a work from home story due to customer contacts, it's a, it's a furlough story. Um, the work from home story is instead, so going back to our, our equation, so we have the log change in labor at home relative to labor at work, as a function of, this is the relative price term, so we, we call it costs here, um, the growth in costs at work, um, the, a measure of ICT, so the technology, available technology to work from home, and then we included other technology measures like um, tangible capital and worker-to-worker -worker contacts. So the, the results, and, and before I even present them, I want to um, present the caveat that this is a relatively small sample. It's quarterly data at the industry level. So we'll, we'll have another quarter um, imminently. Um, but for now, it, it's a small sample. Um, but we are seeing a pretty substantial impact. These are two statistics um, of the change in worker costs. So relative prices um, do seem to have a, a large effect on the relative shares working at home versus working at work. So when it's costly to work at work, um, you have more workers working at home. Um, and so if it's costly to protect workers in the workplace, you see a larger work at home share. Um, the other thing that um, plays an important role is the ICT share. So in more information technology intensive industries, you see more um, workers working at home. Uh, and this is the cross industry effects that it, it just jumps out of the charts and it, and it shows up in the regress, regression as well. Um, physical capital tends to go the other direction. So industries like um, manufacturing and other production industries that have a lot of physical capital tend to have less working at home. They don't have none, but they tend to have less working at home. But the ICT share essentially cap captures that uh, effect on its own. Um, let me skip that chart in the interest of time. Um, so to summarize, what seems to drive labor at home versus labor at work is strong two effects, the strong price effects and the strong ICT effect um, that capture sort of the technology or the, the ability to work at home. So the price effect suggests that there is room to reverse uh, work from home when the virus reverts um, in the sense that as the cost to working at work decline, um, if this substitutability, this elasticity of substitution is symmetric, 
um, then you could see uh, workers going back to the office when it's less expensive to, to work from the office or uh, the, the sales floor or the factory floor. Um, on the other hand, this is a strong effect of, of technology. So industries that have uh, a high share of information and communications technology also have more work from home and that's not going away. Um, so that capacity was there before, it's there now. Um, so that suggests that the obstacle um, to working from home before may have been something like this collective action problem that we described. Uh, once the collection act, collective action problem has been overcome by this large shock, um, then it may continue. And uh, surveys of worker preference suggest that they would like to continue to work at home uh, two to three days a week. Um, we've seen that data in both the, the UK and the US. So what are the implications uh, from all of this? I mean, we see uh, a large impact um, of the, um, in, in the pandemic of work from home and, and the capital that enable it um, on GDP. Um, and, and we didn't see an impact of ICT and, and other kinds of intangible capital on productivity pre-COVID. Um, my colleague, Bob Gordon, is, is pretty adamant um, about this. Um, but we do see a big effect during COVID. So it may be that the internet um, is, is having its moment that, that it uh, found the situation in which it was very valuable to have resilience. Uh, and that the value of that resilience was most evident um, during this severe and, and very catastrophic uh, shock. The other is that there's clearly distributional implications that this COVID um, didn't, there was not resilience for everyone. Um, there's clear differences across industries and was especially least helpful for those with the, the lowest incomes. Um, so we may see um, future investment in, in different industries um, and also greater distribution across geographies. We've focused on work on premises, work at home, but that may translate to work in different locations, even across different countries. Um, so the effects we find you know, are, are very large in this very limited period of time. Um, they, they suggest that perhaps there's, there's promise for large effects elsewhere. Um, the historians have thought about this uh, and thought about you know, what the long run impacts of being able to work from home um, may be. So um, Joel Mokir has emphasized this um, sort of across the sweep of time. Uh, working at home is not a new thing. Artisanal production started out at home uh, and then moved into factories and maybe now it's going back home again, um, but enabled by digital technologies. So let me stop with that um, and answer any questions that uh, you may have and, and pull Paul and Jonathan in if they would like. Okay, thanks a lot, Janice. That was very interesting. Yeah, so uh, let me just remind the audience, if you want to answer or uh, ask a question, uh, raise your hand and uh, then I'll allow you to talk. Um, I think we have a first question from uh, Claudia, uh, if she's there, and also Stefania has a question. Um, uh, let's go with Claudia first. And Okay. All right. Yeah. So the great presentation this is so cool and such cool data too. Um, one thing I wanted to ask, and this is probably a little more big picture going forward. What you're showing is such an adaptability of the economy to produce. And I wonder, and you talked a little bit about going forward, but I know we have a lot of debate about potential output and what the economy could do as this recovery is happening. And do you have anything to say about that like big picture thinking about how much we can adjust how malleable the economy could be as maybe a lot of demand is coming at it uh, um i don't know jonathan sees uh, a lot of this let me let me reply from the from the u.s perspective and i think people are expecting 
you know, and, and our estimate of the elasticity of substitution is is very high um, to the point that we're a little suspicious of it, and are you know are going to push harder uh, on the on the data. Um, and but I think for the U.S., the the concern people have is about the labor that's actually available um, to return to work because labor force participation has fallen. Um, so we're not taking in taking that into account, right? We have workers who are at home that we anticipate going back to work and they may at least be partially more productive there. Um, but I think the, the, the concern behind the kind of skepticism about um, ability to increase output is more about um, labor force participation. And, and we're not gonna help much on that. Um, but you would say- Oh, yeah. sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I didn't say, but you would, would you say that there's still some untapped potential of home production? I mean, you think about like Airbnbs yeah, totally sure. shut down and now right. that it's safe. I don't know. I just think it's fascinating, but I, Jonathan, you wanted to say something too. So, no, just, just to agree with Jan and, and thanks very much for the question, Claudia, um, it is of course, if you think that part of this working from home is not only a substitution as uh, Jan has been setting out, but also a widening of the labour market, a widening of access to the labour market to other people who are, let's say they've got more domestic responsibilities, you know, less able to commute and it widens all of that. It kind of shifts out the labour supply curve, essentially, um, which may have distributional implications. But to your point, then the economy in principle, it seems to me, would be better able to accommodate um, a big demand increase. Uh, not a problem we have in Europe, uh, but I'm very happy that that might be a problem you might have in the US. Yeah. And you, you have to think that we'll get better at this, you know, because we're, we're all sort of cobbling together um, our work from home arrangements um, over the last year, and that in a more deliberate environment, you know, where you can actually get a, you can order a camera and, and have it come and there's not a chip shortage, um, that we might actually be more successful, especially on hybrid. I don't think we've figured out a hybrid. It, it's been a very reactive um, process. And that in a more deliberate process, um, we might be more successful uh, in a, I think especially hybrid. If you've tried to do hybrid, it's it's very hard. Perhaps I could come in here as well, because uh, I think one of the factors that many people have found difficult in working from home has been juggling all the different responsibilities. People who are working from home with children have much more difficulty than those who don't have children. So clearly that was a feature of the, um, the COVID experience that we probably won't repeat if we carry on working from home outside of it. So um, at least not in, when, when schools are, uh, are, when children are at school. So, um, so that's likely to be uh, <laughs> um, something that will make working from home more efficient, not less. Okay, uh, thanks a lot. So Stefania, I think had a question as well. Yeah, so um, I, I, I had two sort of related uh, questions, comments. So you showed the strong impact of pre-pandemic ICT adoption across industries. And then uh, you also showed these results about certain sectors where you know, there was no ability to work from home because that was in the nature of the activity. So I also have been looking at that on the labor um, side. And so, as you said, you know, these service occupations sort of customer facing, there's no ability to work from home, but also a lot of production occupations that operate capital, you know, within the context of a warehouse or um, a plant. Um, uh, so those production workers also were not able to uh, produce on, uh, work from home. But in those kinds of industries, there's also less of a need to invest in ICT technology just in general, because the work is really based on either customer interaction or operating this, this you know, conventional machinery and capital. So the industries that had high ICT adoption beforehand that was also in the nature of those activities and so basically what the most important capital was in fact this more intangible ICT capital and there was just a switch in use of it um, so the the kind of sitting at a desk the desk doesn't really matter it's the what you have in the cloud if you're in financial services or in a professional type uh, sector and then but then I was also thinking about the short run versus long run effects in terms of the ability um, to use this because if you're you know the pandemic hits and you have a bunch of ongoing projects and 
and you're in financial services or you're an architecture firm, you can continue working remotely on those projects that are already there. But you know, by working remotely, are you going to be able to start new you know, activities and what is the productivity of that? And I guess right now, I think um, in many industries, there was sort of more of a keeping things going relative to pre-pandemic. And I, I don't know if there's any way to measure whether there has been less, um, you know, uh, starting of new activities in this, you know, remote or hybrid, you know, work setting, and if that would affect uh, the productivity measures and how that's going to look for uh, look like going forward. I know it's a bit of a speculative question, but it, it, can we measure that yet? Or have we measured any impact on that? What are your thoughts? I think we saw a little of this um, in that when we looked at that quarterly data, I sort of mentioned, you know, that there could have been some learning over time. Um, we do see some changes across the, the quarters, and I don't think we've we've gotten that precisely yet, which is why I didn't present it um, yet. But, you know, for example, in, in restaurants, you know, it, it's very difficult to do that from home, but you did see investments in, um, you know, takeaway and online ordering and, you know, and, and that evolved over time. So it may be that even, you know, over the course of the last year, we may see, uh, we may be able to observe um, the effect of greater investments in ICT um, mm -hmm. or different kinds of, of labor. And, um, I, Paul and Jonathan have talked before about um, responses to the different shutdowns uh, in the UK. And the, the, the responses, and they, they, I've only heard this from them, so they, they should say it, uh, might have been less severe um, over time because there was a kind of learning and, and investments that, that you're talking about. Okay, great. Um, I have a question from Eran Yashif. Eran? You can unmute yourself. Yes, thank you. Uh, it's a very interesting and very useful paper. Uh, I'm also happy to see that your findings are consistent with stuff like we've heard from Dingle and Neyman about work from home, uh, something like a third of the economy, uh, which after seeing the fast moving slides looks to be very similar numbers. My question though is this, you emphasized, Jan, at the beginning, the issue of connectivity, that it's not just the availability of internet and Zoom capabilities per se, but the fact that you've got a network, you've got a connection, you're connected to others. So I'm presuming you are, or I'm asking, are you calculating that part as well? And what about what has gone out, which is the interactions between workers on premises, which are now absent, can you quantify that missing part as well? I don't know if you guys wanna, wanna take this. Right now, we, we're, in what I showed, there's not a direct measure of that connectivity. And we've talked about how to isolate that because the capital measure we have now is just this dwellings or residential, right? So we're just, it's just the, the physical capital, but we've, we've done a little side calculation of looking at the, what in, in this calculation is the TFP measure and breaking that TFP measure out into what's the ICT capital um, and, and which I think gets more to the connectivity point um that you're um that you're emphasizing um so it's it's on the agenda um i think we don't have anything precise enough to um to put on a slide yet okay i had um last question we're running a bit over time but i had a quick question from uh Josepa as well uh, let me just uh, allow Josepa to talk hello uh, hi, Jen, everyone. That was really interesting. Yeah, it was just um, more of a comment slash question, which is uh, one thing I found striking is the difference in uh, total factor productivity growth. So the UK seems to, the model says the UK had really fast TFP growth in that quarter. I think the US was a bit intermediate, all the Europeans had kind of big drops. So Jonathan already kind of answered the question, but uh, I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on that. Sorry. 
Uh, I'll come in. I mean, it's a great question, and we should look at that a little bit more. Um, for those of you who aren't in the deep weeds of all of this stuff, there's, there's quite a big issue amongst um, policymakers, um, not uh, and many others, but policymakers in particular about the different experiences across different countries, how it relates to the differential time that they entered lockdowns, the type of industry structure, which um, Jose, you know, your nice question um, touched on. Um, turns out the UK has got lots more sort of socially based industries, music, restaurants, you know, things, things like that. Um, so all of those together are going to give you this sort of this this um, uh, group of, uh, of a different industry mix, a different lockdown times and all that kind of thing. So um, we probably do need to do some more work to sort of document all of that. Um, but that's surely part of understanding the differential behavior <laughs> across the different countries. Yeah. OK, I, we are running a bit over time, so I think uh, we will stop the official session here. But th those of you who want to talk a bit more, if you go to the chat. There's a link uh, to another Zoom room mm -hmm. uh, where uh, everybody interested uh, can turn up. And with that, let me thank both, spe both set of speakers for a very interesting talk. Thank you.